so in the story of the story bag, um, keeping stories hidden can lead to really dangerous situations. Uh, how important is it, especially in our current world, for Asian American storytellers to be able to have spaces to share their stories and be heard? Yes, it is hugely important. I would say it's important for, for Asian Americans, period, to speak up and be heard. We, we cannot be invisible anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it is important for people to know that we are here, to know that we have been here for uh, over 100 years. We have contributed to this country. For instance, how many people know that the most decorated unit in the history of the United States military was the 100th Battalion 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the all Japanese American unit that fought for the United States in World War II. They were the most decorated unit. How many people know that? Um, people should know our history. Uh, unfortunately, this anti-Asian uh, violence that we're seeing now is not new. Ever since right. Asians first came to this country, say in the mid 1800s with the Chinese workers on the Transcontinental Railroad, if you, if you look at the history, you could see just through the years, the anti-Asian laws that were passed and the discrimination and uh, the, the, the really terrible discrimination and hardships that the Asians had to live with in this country. Um, and I had hoped that we were getting to better times. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the anti-Asian violence recently has, has been discouraging to see, I, especially it just breaks my heart to see our elders who have been attacked. Um, so uh, it is important that people know uh, our story, how much we have contributed to this country, um, what good Americans we are, and uh, listen to our voices. And so I am really thrilled anytime that Asian American storytellers can get out there and be seen and heard. What's in your story bag? What, what stories did you hear growing up and what do you like to tell? I actually didn't hear many stories growing up. Uh, I know, uh, but I was a huge reader. So I read Grimm's fairy tales. Uh, my favorite books growing up were the Anne of Green Gables series, the Canadian classic. <laughs> I was named after Anne of Green Gables. Oh, yes. Yeah. And with an E, and with an E, and I just loved those books. They're wonderful books, beautifully written. Um, you know, I grew up with Little House in the Big Woods, that, that sort of thing. And so uh, I became, I, because I love to read, I became uh, an elementary school librarian. And uh, I did that for 35 years. I retired about 12 years ago. And uh, in there, I became a storyteller. So I've been a storyteller for about 38 years now. So I started out the first 25 years of my storytelling, telling a lot of folk tales from around the world and really concentrating, of course, on Japanese stories because it gave me an opportunity to really feel like I was touching base with my own heritage, mm -hmm. of course. Although, unfortunately, I didn't hear these Japanese stories at my grandmother's knee. Um, my grandmother spoke uh, mostly Japanese, and I was raised speaking English, so I had to learn my stories from books. But um, then, about 15 years ago, I started to work on a family history project. I wanted to make a photo book, and I realized that I had to get the stories. And so my Japanese American family was like most Japanese American families. They never talked about the war. They never talked about the incarceration. Yeah. Nobody talked about it. So I didn't know much about it. And I realized that it was time to find out. And I was going to have to, well, my grandparents had passed away. My father had passed away. Um, there was only one person of his generation living, my aunt, who was 91 year, years old at the time. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed her and it was actually a little hard to think of doing that because my family had never talked about this. And you sort of get this 
unspoken idea that you shouldn't talk about it, but I, I knew time was running out. So I interviewed her and fortunately she was happy to talk about it. And um, uh, I ended up to my surprise, this was not my intention, but I ended up creating a story about my family coming to the United States and going through the war. And my own two parents were not in camp because my father was in Hawaii working and my mother was born and raised in Hawaii. But my grandparents and my father's three siblings were forced out of their homes in Portland, Oregon. My grandfather had a grocery store yeah. and they were put into camp. I tell this story with photographs from my family because I want everyone to see my family and meet my family. And I also have photographs from the National Archives showing camp and what camp looked like and the barracks. Wow. And yeah. Like, because most people have never seen these. And, you know, I could describe it all I want, but to really see the photographs makes a huge difference. Um, so that story, it's about a 40 minute story. And that story has really become, I've done it for about 14 years now, and it's really be become the most important work that I do, I think, in storytelling. Mm -hmm. And um, generally, my, my uh, audiences have been very supportive, and very welcoming, and they want to know uh, more about that time. Well, thank you for so, so much for spending time with me today. Well, thank you. And thank you for watching. If you enjoy the show, please like, share, or subscribe below. You can also help keep the stories coming by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash MV Story Dance. I'll see you next time for episode six and the last of season two. In the meantime, you can catch any missed episodes right here.